Growth equity. We, we chose this topic because it's a source of capital that I felt we'd like to bring to the membership of SIA, one that's not necessarily very well understood, and a source of capital that really is much more than just about capital. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Chang. I'm with Grant Thornton. Grant Thornton is a uh, professional services firm with audit tax and advisory. We focus on growing companies. And I lead up the M&A technology uh, practice within Grant Thornton, helping companies such as yours uh, raise capital and uh, under uh, M&A situations. So I'd like to ask the panel to introduce themselves, and I'll, I'll start with Gus at Trident Capital. Great. Hi, good morning. Um, name's Gus Alvarelli. Uh, I'm a partner at Trident Capital, founded in 93. Uh, we were originally founded as a multi-stage, both venture and growth equity firm. Uh, in the last few years, we've actually evolved to exclusively focusing on growth equity. Uh, we can probably later on this panel talk about some of the reasons we, we did that and, and we're excited about investing in that type of business and uh, sector. Uh, we focus only on technology and within that software is about 80% of our investments. We'll also do some tech-enabled services as well. Uh, and within software, uh, we have a couple of verticals that we spend quite a bit of time on. Uh, I personally, I spend quite a bit in IT security uh, and vertical uh, market software and also uh, financial technology. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Gus. Uh, John, do you want to? Sure. Next? Sure. Uh, my name is John Hodge. I'm a partner at a firm, a new firm called uh, Rubicon Technology Partners. Uh, just formed uh, last year. Uh, we focus exclusively on enterprise software. Um, businesses and uh, my background just to give you a little bit more context uh, I've spent my whole career 25 years in technology uh, started out right out of school <coughs> believe it or not working for Oracle when it was a 500 million dollar business um, in the vertical sales business in, in 1989 um, but uh, a long time ago but but I've um, uh, been in technology my, my whole career and we founded this firm um, because we thought there was a unique opportunity, uh, as Mark said, here in the market for enterprise software companies to add not just financial um, help, but fundamentally some operational help through um, a framework uh, that we deploy to all of our companies. Um, we've had probably experience with over 45 enterprise software companies, and we've created a set of tools that companies can utilize to um, better be oper better create operational maturity, we'll, which we'll talk about a little bit um, later. So. Great. And Peter. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, Peter Rotier. I'm a principal at Summit Partners out of our uh, Menlo Park, California office. Um, I've been at Summit for about eight years now, which sounds kind of crazy to say. Uh, my, my background is 15 years of investment banking and venture capital, private equity investing all around the tech space and, and the growth economy. Summit as a firm has, uh, has been in the growth equity business for three decades. We were founded in 1984. We've raised um, approximately 15 billion of capital, uh, deployed that across 400 investments, predominantly in the technology space. Two thirds of our investments are technology, and within that sector, software is the single largest portion of our, our historical portfolio. It's roughly 115 investments in the software space, and it's, it's everything, every model, um, from applications to infrastructure, co cloud delivery, on-premise, freemium, converting to paid, um, and venture-like investments all the way up to uh, buyouts, control transactions into more mature uh, enterprise software businesses. So very happy to be here today. Okay, thank you everyone. So uh, I'll start the first question with you, Gus. Maybe you can just give us a uh, kind of a one or uh, growth equity 101. What is growth equity? Who should be considering it? Sure. Um, you know, gro growth equity and as, as an asset class has been around, uh, you know, for at least kind of maybe almost coming up on 50 years with, with TA uh, being kind of one of the granddaddy uh, you know, firms that, that really started pioneering that and, and Summit uh, you know, really took it to the next level. Um, you know, the way we define growth equity uh, is uh, a little bit along the lines of what Cambridge does with a couple differences. Cambridge formally last year came out and, and finally created growth equity uh, as an asset class where they're tracking benchmarks and, and, uh, and the like. Uh, for us, growth equity means, you know, it's businesses that are break even to profitable, uh, typically north of 10, 15 million of revenues, 
uh, you know, for us, growing north of 25, 30 percent, um, and that's one of the areas of differentiation, you know, that you might have, you know, when people talk about growth equity, for some people it might be as low as 10, you know, 15. For us, it's kind of 25, 30. And, and typically, it's, it's first institutional capital. And again, that's, again, how we think about it. That, that may mean different things uh, to different firms. But we're not looking, especially since we're here in Silicon Valley, we're not looking to be the series C, D, you know, E or F round into an unprofitable business that's raised, you know, 50 million bucks and has, you know, 10, 15 million of revenues. Uh, so that, that I would put that much more in the late stage venture capital bucket. Um, the reason we like it is, you know, we, we kind of looked historically at some of the category leaders, specifically within software. And if you look at, you know, how they got started, a lot of them were very capital efficient businesses. And, and we don't think that's a coincidence. In fact, the, the, the decisions and the, the culture that gets built uh, in the early days of businesses, uh, you know, ends up resulting in those guys being industry leaders. And I'll give you an example. It's one thing to say you're customer centric. Uh, it's another thing to have to be customer centric or you don't make payroll. So, you know, engineers in capital efficient bootstrap businesses aren't, you know, off building products because they think it's cool. Uh, they're doing it because that's what the customers want and they're really focused on uh, building, you know, products that will sell in the marketplace. So oftentimes when we get involved, it'll either be a minority or majority transaction, and the capital is used for, you know, often drew growth capital. Uh, they want to build out a new product. They want to expand sales and marketing. They might want to do a small acquisition. Or the founders, uh, you know, want to take some chip off the table or some of the early, you know, friends, family, and fools that, that came in or maybe a small regional uh, invest, you know, venture firm that put in a couple million bucks wants to cash out. Uh, a part of their holdings. And sometimes it's a combination of all of what I just described. So our typical checks, equity checks, are anywhere from kind of 10 million on the low end up to 30, 35 on the high end. Okay, thank you, Gus. Peter, maybe similar question for you. Yeah. Uh, what do you look for at Summit in terms of company profile, um, you know, kind of their motivation, yeah. key things? Similar question, similar answer. Um, we would define the growth equity space uh, in very much the same way. I think over time, we, as we've grown our firm and promulgated the strategy internationally and broadened our asset base in North America, we've also started looking at some larger, more mature um, investments as well. So increasingly, uh, out of our, our larger funds, we've got a two-fund equity structure in the U.S., kind of a, a $500 million uh, venture fund that's investing between $10 million up to $50 million, and then a $3 billion uh, private equity fund that kind of picks up from there and invests all the way up to $500 million per company. Uh, in the latter fund, uh, you still growth-oriented businesses, but lower top-line growth rates in certain examples, doing some more operational change, doing some acquisitions, um, and likely to be more of a structured or a control transaction. And sometimes you'll find companies that are pivoting from an on-premise license-based model that they've been at for some time to a cloud delivery model, which impacts the top-line growth rates. We've got a lot of experience managing, managing through that, or they're top grading the sales force and the like. Um, but fundamentally, a lot of things that Gus shared are the same. So growth-oriented companies and sectors that we like, obviously software, um, bias towards profitability or break-even. If we get towards the scale of more towards the break-even or even slightly, uh, slight operating losses, but break-even and profitability is in sight, we would sort of expect the growth rate to be a little bit higher to be commensurate with the risk. So in that case, it might be 40, 50 plus percent revenue growth. Um, and if you're very, very profitable, we're comfortable investing at lower growth rates. Um, but that's kind of how we think about growth and profitability trade-offs along the growth equity spectrum. Great, okay, thank you. John, I'll give you a similar question, but could you also add on and, and kind of expand on how is it uh, that kind of Rubicon or, or yourself, it, it's more than just capital? Yep. Yeah, so ba back to the definition of uh, growth capital. We, we Again, you've, you've seen, the, I think the definition of the type of companies we work with are probably similar. We look at growth as we call it operational growth. Okay, so um, when we try to work with companies, the first thing we look for with a management team is do you need help other than financial help? simply, okay? And um, are you looking for somebody that has experience to help the company uh, in some way, okay? And that can be with revenue growth, with product management. The way we think about enterprise software companies after investing in many of them for our careers, 
Um, enterprise software companies need to do six things well, okay? And it sounds pretty simple. Um, you know, and normally in the lower end of the market, companies, you know, of sizes between 15 million of revenues all the way up to $100 million in, in revenues, many times if you are growing and successful, you probably do two or three of those things well, okay? You don't do all six well. And that's just a pattern recognition that we've seen over thousands of companies. And our approach is very simple, which is we look and we spend time with the management teams and, and evaluate these companies and say, fundamentally, these are the two things you do incredibly well, and we're not going to screw with those. Just you're going to do them well, and we're going you know, to help you enhance those. But we come in with a set of tools as well as resources and say, you need to improve these three things. You know, classically, many enterprise software companies, back to business models, do not know how to price their products correctly, okay? And there's methodologies in how to price products correctly to go to market strategy. The second thing is many times if you're looking at a go to market strategy, you know, how do you sell enterprise software into the enterprise? Um, there are certain ways where larger mature companies do that more effectively than smaller companies, for example. So when it comes to our methodology, our methodology is simply we want to work with companies that view our role as helping the company in some way operationally. And, um, and so th that, that is the, the main reason that we invest in companies. We, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that, that don't need our help, okay, or don't think they need our help. That's perfectly fine, okay. Go, go be successful, you know, we hope you're successful. But, um, you know, we really view ourselves as operational. You know, you can see the, all of the partners in our firms have worked actually in software companies and have run software companies and we have a pattern of operating companies very, very effectively. Um, uh, so that's a little bit, you know, how we think about investing. Great, great. Uh, Peter, I'll, I'll kind of put it to you. Um, maybe you can kind of elaborate on a, a few kind of successful investments, what they look like, um, and, and presumably, again, kind of the theme, it's more than capital, right? So if you could talk about kind of what Summit brings as a value proposition. Yeah, sure. Um, so. I mean, we talk about two quick ones that have uh, very different profiles. Um, so in the, uh, the first example, it'll be very high growth business um, where we made a, a, you know, a slight majority investment, mostly for liquidity and some, some growth capital. But it was a company actually that had a software platform that they were using to um, stand up websites, monetize traffic, do sort of algorithms on the value of traffic, uh, which was an incredibly profitable business. Uh, but didn't have long-term sort of enterprise value. And they had a, a goal of kind of building a larger destination online and then leveraging all of the data that they had and selling that to businesses in sort of a, a SaaS-based model. So we, we backed a team when they're pretty early, like 17 million in revenues, guys out of Washington University, 22, 23 years old, very much a feel of a venture company, growing fast, making money, but not really sure how they were doing it. Um, we bought a good portion of the business, allowed them to kind of put that money in their bank, take care of their kids, you know, pay off houses and the like, and then really kind of you know, throw the long ball. Um, so we came in, we invested $50 million early on. Uh, we ended up taking a company private called Answers.com, which was kind of a orphaned public uh, digital media company, merged it in. That business was roughly $20 million of revenue and, and barely making any money, uh, restructured that entire business. Um, and today it's you know, a very, very profitable, much larger company. And we've subsequently acquired and built software businesses and recruited executives in. Um, so all in today, the, we took the business from 17 million in revenues, it's called Answers Corp, to about 200 million in revenues and very, very profitable, uh, both on the organic growth side and the acquisition growth side. And more than 60% of our revenues are coming outside of monetization in our digital media business. So that's an example of kind of a venture view on yeah. a very high growth company, great technology, really gutsy and eager entrepreneurs. Um, a typical venture capitalist would have said, it's not really my fit. A typical private equity guy would have said, it's not really my fit, I don't understand it. But knowing both of the models um, and having the, the uh, resources to help them get through the, those M&A processes and recruit the right team as has uh, become a, a tremendous outcome for us. Right. Um, so that's sort of a high growth uh, setup. The other one would be 
a company that I'm invested in called Help Systems, which is a legacy enterprise software vendor. It's, uh, they sell tools mostly to the IBM power server, IBM I market. This is not a growth market. Um, it's a market that sort of exists and stays, but it's a stable market. Um, so we invested in a very high cash flow business with a vision of diversifying it into the open system space. And we've been investing dollars post-close into new product development, recruiting new product managers, as well as acquisitions to diversify that business. Um, and so th that's a situation where it's lower growth, big cash flow is much more stable, but you have to have an appreciation for the markets that they're in and desire to be in, mm -hmm. in order to help that team execute on their goals. Okay, excellent examples. Gus, uh, kind of similar uh, question for you as well. Um, Trident Capital, of course, you know, we've talked about this, a venture background now, very focused on the growth equity space. Um, as well as, you know, Trident has brought a good number of companies uh, to a very successful place. Um, long list of portfolio companies. Would you like to talk about any of, of them? And uh, sure. We, we had one that actually um, I was involved in uh, that fits kind of the growth equity playbook uh, that we like to, you know, focus on now pretty much to a T. So, uh, you know, 2010, uh, companies called Prolexic, it was in South Florida. Um, in 2010, they finished with about 14 million of revenues, growing 35%, 2 million of EBITDA. And uh, the owners of the business were essentially, you know, kind of a, a, a family office uh, and, and, and the management team. When the first time I met with the CEO at the time, he said, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. And, you know, as a PE guy, you always get a little excited when someone says that. You're like, great, I'm, I'm excited to be here too. And, and, and he's like, no, it's just, it's just wonderful. The timing's perfect. Fantastic. He's like, I, I really want to be like my neighbors. And at that point, I was like, I, you know, kind of looked at him and said, I don't know who your neighbors are. Uh, but he's like, well, my neighbors are retired and I want to be retired. And I said, okay, so we need to, we need to hire a new CEO for a South Florida cybersecurity business. And, you know, other than Citrix and Ultimate Software, there isn't a lot of software companies in South Florida. Uh, so that was going to be a challenge. But we were fortunate enough to uh, have within our network uh, a seasoned exec who had been a three-time CEO. Uh, he had taken a South Florida company that spun out of Harris um, called CyberGuard. He, he had taken that you know, from a $20 million valuation when him and, uh, and the investor picked it up and sold it for 300, uh, you know, four and a half years later, grew the business, uh, both top line and bottom line, pretty, pretty impressively. So we you know, looked at this business with 14 million of trailing revenues and 2 million of EBITDA in the distributed dial of service space. Mostly they were selling to the gaming industry and we wanted to, you know, we thought there was a real opportunity to expand outside of, of that space. And we were already starting to see some traction they were getting with some of the financial services guys, uh, cloud providers. So they currently have salesforce.com, Workday, um, uh, Viva as, as customers because you can't be always on software if a distributed denial of service attack can, can take you down. So. Um, Anyways, we, we made a, a slight majority investment in that case of, of, of 12.9 million. Uh, you know, put uh, put uh, uh, some money on the on the balance sheet, um, and uh, you know, happy to report that you know, working with the CEO, we uh, we were able to make a lot of uh, you know strong hires. Um, you know, some remote. You know, one of the sessions that I attended uh, yesterday talked about you know in, in regions, even in Silicon Valley, where talent the talent war is fierce. You have to be flexible on where some of the employees are. We also relocated a lot of employees. So happy to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in doing that. Um, Florida's a little easier to reload than, than some areas because it's tax-free. Uh, there's no state income tax there, so that, that helped a lot. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, that, that company will end up doing 80 million of, of revenues this year, and uh, the 12.9 became 187 three years later when Akamai bought the company. Um, uh, in February of this year, so that uh, that was my, actually my first deal at Trident as a partner. So okay. I get uh, extra lunch on Mondays yeah, now. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Great. Well, hey, John, I worked with you on a couple of recent investments. Yep. Now the the founders and the management team, for the most part, are continuing on. So uh, selfishly, because you know much of the uh, audience here may be in a similar position, what's in it for them? Yep. What, why are they on board? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, 
really, we, we, all of us I kind of, you know, work with entrepreneurs as, as one of our core competencies, right? Um, and whether that's to transition, um, to kind of improve the operational maturity of the business and then ultimately with, with the original, you know, entrepreneur. Um, and I think a partner, all three of us kind of, you can, can hear this, you know, we, we've got pattern recognition on a lot of other companies that many times we've seen with entrepreneurs uh, who are very successful have not been at multiple companies to see what success and define success of these multiple companies means. We do, that's our job. We see a lot of different types of companies and the behaviors of these companies and, and different processes that they bring. And so I think, you know, bringing in partners like us um, uh, uh, help you kind of increase your perspective on how to operate your company better and how to increase ultimately, I believe also, most importantly, your exit options, okay? I will tell you that I think that um, the one value that is, is undervalued from our perspective is the ability for investors like us to help you strategically position yourself for an ultimate exit. Um, and I think that, you know, one example we just, today we just announced a transaction, a founder owned, you know, a founder owned business, a great business growing 30%, it's a pure SaaS based business. Um, and he actually reached out to us directly because it is a fantastic product. Um, you know, uh, one of the leading products uh, validated through Gartner. And fundamentally he, though it's a US based company where they're selling to a very um, small niche and he did not know how to fundamentally expand a global support and sales infrastructure to really take advantage of what he thinks is a huge market opportunity, okay? That's one. He did go out and talk to strategics also and said, listen, you know, it may be that I've just, you know, gotten to the point where I've grown the company and, and now somebody else, the strategics can take it, you know, and I can sell it at a good price. Um, and we came in and we had a discussion with him and said, yeah, ultimately we think a strategic exit is exactly what you need but the strategics will pay you more in three to five years if you do the following three things to your company, okay? And we can help you do that. And so ultimately he, you know, he decided to stay in the business, run the business, and reinvest in the business with us. Um, and, you know, the, the one, and the main reason for that is he fundamentally believed that we could, as investors, help him improve the business and ultimately sell the business in three to five years for a significantly higher price than he could get today, even though we were buying the business today at a significantly discount to what the, the, the uh, strategics were gonna pay him today for the business. And I think that's an example, a very real example of the value that we can actually add to a process. And, you know, and I will tell you that this has been tested many, many times. You know, I've, for 25 years, have talked to a lot of corporates uh, in enterprise software and spent a lot of my career with these guys. And I can tell you whether it's Oracle, IBM, Salesforce, that the main way they grow today Okay, and the only way they grow is through acquisitions and acquisitions of small enterprise software companies. It's, that's the only way they grow. That's where they get their innovation. Um, and, but they also have a pattern recognition where they also know they've made a lot of acquisitions. What doesn't work? And a lot of times if you ask them what doesn't work is actually that the companies that come into, that they acquire are not operationally mature enough to integrate into these large behemoth companies and they lose a lot of what they're looking for. And so they actually look to us in the growth area or the private equity area to help companies mature to the point where they can be integrated into larger organizations, okay? And that is critical to how they create value also. And so it's our, that's fundamentally our thesis, which is we wanna work with you know, entrepreneurs or with management teams uh, that fundamentally need help in operationally maturing the businesses so you ultimately will be able to exit, you know, at a higher multiple to your, uh, to the strategics down the road. So. John, I want to pick up uh, for Peter one of the points that you started alluding to, which is uh, I, I know the private equity uh, firms and growth equity firms help uh, portfolio companies with bolt-ons and, and getting that scale. Um, so, Peter, do you want to talk about, uh, about that kind of process, uh, what you've seen Summit yeah. do? Yeah, this has been an area of sort of evolution for us as we've grown, uh, particularly as we've invested in companies that aren't growing 100 percent, right, and are right. introducing a bunch of new products, more mature businesses. Um, it, we've had a lot of success sitting down early on uh, with a, an entrepreneur and a company saying, okay, let's get the organic growth strategy right, and here's how we can help you. Um, but let's also talk about if acquisitions are applicable. In many cases, they're not. It doesn't make any sense. You shouldn't do it. Right. And in the cases that they are, 
let's talk about some of those targets because um, one of the things that makes Summit unique, and a lot of firms do this, but we're very proactive in our outreach. We've got a database that's been built up over 30 years of 500,000 private companies around the globe, and we talk to them a lot, and we employ a lot of younger professionals to sort of track companies by sector and size and scale and growth rate. And so one of the things we've been very effective at in the last five years and in my personal portfolio is sitting down and almost doing a industry landscape of potential acquisition targets. And we'll go out and be like an outsourced corporate development arm for you. Let's have weekly or biweekly calls, talk to the right people in the divisions, that'll be our point person. We'll vet them, we'll help structure them. We've got a capital markets team internally that can help with credit and other uh, structuring issues that come up. We've got an operations team that can help on the integration side. We don't have a fee charging business to our portfolio companies. We don't do that at all. Uh, but if there is a, a growth path via M&A, we think we bring something unique uh, by our go-to-market strategy and deal sourcing, investment sourcing, um, and by our sort of three pillars of our operating strategy, uh, which is our talent management. We have a distinct group that does that, our internal consulting and our, our capital markets group. Okay, good. Gus, I want to give you a two-part question. Uh, one, kind of, if you want to elaborate any on the discussions that John or Peter has, have had. And then, uh, if you could as well, I, I think this audience might want to understand what kind of process is a company going to go through if they want to receive growth equity? How long does it take? What, what should they expect to uh, you know, kind of go through? Sure, why don't I start with the second part of the, the question? Um, you know, I think the, the first one is pretty similar to, to what got discussed. Um, you know, the, so everyone in this audience that runs a software business at some point has probably been pinged either by a banker, uh, some sort of advisor, uh, maybe even one of our firms. Um, and you know, there's a lot that goes into that decision-making process of Who's the right partner? What's the right time? What are the things to consider? Um, you know, the, the reality is as, as, you, as you think about this, uh, the personal relationship ends up being very important, especially if, if you're giving up control of your business. So you need to feel comfortable um, you know, working, working with a PE partner, a growth equity partner. Uh, but but you know, so, so why don't I kind of take it from the top? So you know, do you hire a banker or not? You know, it really comes down to what you're looking to do. If your end goal is to maximize price to the absolute nth degree in a majority transaction, I think a banker may make sense. Uh, and I say may because it's not clear that, you know, that banker may be able to do that for you. Um, there's, there's certain benefits to actually not hiring a banker and actually giving firms, quote unquote, the opportunity to preempt the process. Um, and sometimes I've seen situations where the prices that people will pay to preempt the banking process ends up being just as high, if not even sometimes a little higher than what the price would be in a full kind of auction bake off. So, so that's one thing. Uh, if you're doing a minority, in that case, you know, I, a banker and the process that that takes, I mean, that could easily take, you know, three to six months, depending on how the banker is planning on doing it. And for a minority raise, that may not be what makes the most sense. Um, again, this, this is one man's opinion, and you know, love to hear other people's thoughts. But, but in a minority raise especially, you know, I would encourage you to go and you know, talk to a few of the firms that, that either have proactively you know, reached out to you and, and you've built up a good rapport with, or you know, firms that you're like, oh, you know, that, that firm invested in so-and-so company, we're kind of the next generation of that. Uh, you know, we're, we're the cloud version of that and they invest in the on-premise version. You know, things like that. Um, you know, the, the, talk to a few firms. Th this idea that you know, everyone's gonna come in at, you know, I'll just pick a number 10, and then there's gonna be that one bluebird that comes in at, at 50. You know, does it happen? Sure, you know, sometimes you can win, you know, you can get blackjack five times in a row in, in Vegas, but, <laughs> but it's unlikely. So, so, you know, the most valuable thing that you guys as entrepreneurs have is your time. And, and you know, as you're, as you're going through this process, you know, there are, there are firms that can make this uh, transaction very seamless. Uh, and certainly kind of the, the three firms here have been around for a while and, and, and we can make that very efficient and quick. 
Um, you know, others, you know, will end up stringing it out for six months. So, you know, I would definitely encourage anyone doing this, uh, you know, speak to the CEOs of the portfolio companies, you know, talk to, you know, entrepreneurs tend to be very open with each other. So if you're thinking about going through a process, you know, talk to some of the CEOs that they've worked with in the past and, you know, they'll, they'll usually give you honest feedback that, that could be helpful when you're choosing a partner. Uh, but to, you know, get back to the question, I would think about, you know, kind of three months and, and you know, kind of plus or minus uh, a couple months from there. You're probably not going to realistically get cash on the balance sheet in, in less than 60 days. Uh, it just, you know, that, that's not going to happen. Um, but but I've, I've certainly seen deals done in, in, you know, in 60 to, you know, 180 days. So that, that's kind of the mindset. Okay, thank you. All right, I I'd like to open it up to the audience if uh, the audience has any questions about growth equity. And do we need to? <coughs> you know. um, how much are you looking at pure play SaaS companies uh, versus uh, software companies? In particular, I see a lot of software companies in vertical markets, they may be 10 to $50 million in revenue. Uh, but don't have the cash in order to transition to a SaaS model, both from uh, the, the dip in terms of cash flow as well as the cost to do multi-tenant and all that. So do you find those attractive, the software companies, and help them go, or you, you look for just pure play SaaS companies? Uh, I'll, I'll start, and then I think the answer is going to be the same yeah. for all three of us, which is uh, business models, uh, that's one of the key differentiators of growth equity, actually, I think, than venture or anything else, which is we will do everything from classic perpetual, you know, license transitioning through hosting to multi-tenanted, you know, and help, actually, because we've had experience doing that in markets, okay, all the way through a pure SaaS-based business. So I think it, it, I will tell you the only thing, so the answer is we will do perpetual, we will do interim, we'll do managed services, we'll do anything. What really you need to define, though, is you need to find your market to see how quickly that change needs to happen. Okay, I think that's the real question. Okay, I think in a lot of the markets that we look at, whether it's for, you know vertical, you know vertical applications, uh, some of the some of the other enterprise <coughs> businesses, you know you have time to make that transition, right. if you know what I mean. And that's the biggest question. And then it's just a matter of do you have the expertise to go do that? And I think private equity has incredible amounts of value in doing that because we've done it many, many times before. So I think fundamentally all of us um, do look at the, that, that, that business transition is a value that we could bring. So totally agree. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's an increasingly common way in which we engage with private enterprise software companies. Right. We've got a lot of experience by virtue of having been investors in the space for a while, you're gonna have companies that are quote unquote legacy or, yeah. I, I hate that word actually, right. this enterprise on-premise right. delivery, because sometimes it actually makes a lot of sense, yeah. um, depending on what market you're in and maybe what vertical you're in. But it's a great way for us to engage with a private company, because we've got experience to bring to bear, we understand it. Um, if not for that, in some instances, you might not be having the conversation with a private equity partner. So. Um, I think unlike the traditional early stage venture capitalists, to John's point, I don't want to repeat all of his words, but it, it, we get it and understand it. I think then structuring the right transaction so that you understand if you're going to you know, decrease your margins for a period of time, your growth rate might change. It, we can help think through that too. That will have impact on deal structure and potentially valuation, but that's a, you know, that's a dialogue that we're pretty facile in. Any, any other questions? Okay, well, well if not, uh, thank you to the panel uh, for the f a very enlightening discussion. And uh, thank you everyone. If uh, you'd like to learn a little bit more about selling your business, Grant Thornton does have a handbook at our booth, so you can feel free to drop by, pick that up, and also feel free to, of course, uh, reach out to uh, any of these three um, on stage. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you.